Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pitts. The Ukraine war geopolitics news update for the 6th of July 2024. We're going to start with uh, Viktor Orban, who went to Kiev and then went to Moscow, but he went to Moscow supposedly on behalf of the EU because they have the rotating presidency of the EU. However, he didn't go with the endorsement of the EU, so it's a bit like maverick. And that's got him into some trouble. Lots of people, well, pretty much everyone, uh, very ang angry with him, apart from Robert Fitz of Slovakia. Ro Benjamin Tallis says, Orban won't resign the chair. He's an international politics and security uh, chap. Um, Orban won't resign the chair, so Hungary should be suspended from the EU until they get in line or choose to leave if they don't like the conditions. There needs to be credible ways to kick countries out that are actively undermining us and th the threat of that would help too. Uh, this is in reaction to Michael Roth and I, and I read that Michael Roth um, statement yesterday. It's a scandal that Orban is shamefully abusing the EU Council presidency and travelling to Kiev without a mandate. He is undermining the core principles of the EU foreign policy. Either the Hungarian government respects its current role in the EU or it should resign as chair. And indeed, the new Dutch Prime Minister, Dick Schuif, condemns Viktor Orban's trip to Moscow. So lots of people did. I read them, uh, a lot of them out yesterday. But I just thought I'd throw this one out there because he's a newly appointed Prime Minister as part of an interesting coalition, including um, Kurt Wilders' PVV. Like many of his colleagues who are members of the EU Council, Schuif noted that Orban has no authority to negotiate with Moscow on behalf of the EU. So it's caused a, a heck of a lot of... Um, of Ferrari, that um, diplomatic clash between Germany and Hungary following the Orban Putin meeting. So, Germany's Baerbock planned. So, Annalena Baerbock is the foreign minister for uh, Germany. She planned to visit Budapest on Monday and probably criticize Orban. But, quote, to our surprise, the Hungarian side cancelled at short notice. We regret the cancellation. So, they basically cancelled a diplomatic visit from the Germans, the Hungarians, because they like knobbed about being you know typically uh difficult the um and also i just again you know so obvious which side his bread is buttered right he just doesn't even try to hide it it just blows my mind and then you have equally problematically the french situation at the moment now i don't know what's going to go on with the voting that's taking place tomorrow the second round of voting for the parliamentary the national assembly uh, elections where you got 522 seats up they got voted for a week ago then you whittle out the people that didn't make 12.5 percent and you basically just definitely have the kind of top two um and then you vote again so it's not quite like pr it is it, like a two two round thing that at least makes it a little bit more representative but um yeah in 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 those elections, it's expected that because of the threat of the far right Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National, although they seem to have got purchased hugely among the population, issues with immigration, but also amplification of those issues and divisions by the troll farms and bot farms in Russia. And that's whipped up this very divisive political storm in France. You've had the French getting, uh, sorry, the French, the left getting together and creating a, a coalition to say, right, we need to get together to vote for our guys, even if they're from different parties, we'll, we'll coalesce around our anti-RM positioning. And you've had the centrists, and I think Republican, have, have, have they not, uh, who are centre-right, also forming a sort of coalition, I think. Uh, and then you've got Rassemblement National, and it's looking like there's going to be about a third of each, which means that you are going to have some kind of parliamentary paralysis going forward and that's not really going to serve anyone my worry is that if that leads to a long-term malaise in 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 the center of french politics then that can actually anger people enough to then want to continue to support rassemblement national so that they do get that overall majority um or i don't know it, it, not necessarily but th that is one option the good thing is that if Jordan Badala doesn't get to be prime minister, 
I don't know what happens. I don't know the French rulings. Somebody French out there, Thierry or someone, can let me know that if you don't get an overall majority in any party, who gets to nominate the prime minister? I could probably Google that easily, but you guys can let me know. If it's Jordan Bardella that becomes prime minister, he, he you will get the situation where um, Le Pen has said, we ain't going to give any scalp EG missiles and definitely French troops won't go to Ukraine, so on and so forth. So Le Pen confirms that serving Putin will be the core of her foreign policy. What a filthy rag she is, says Janky, if he doesn't hold back with this rhetoric. Um, Marine Le Pen promises French far right will rein in aid to Ukraine and slam stocker star, star Mbappe. So Mbappe, as a, uh, a black French football player at the Euro 2024 finals, uh, they got through uh, last night in a close game against Portugal. Anyway, he he's come out very uh, big. And I think Lilian Turan's uh, son as well, who plays uh, Turan, who plays for, I don't know, I can't remember his first name, plays for the French team. I think he's also come out very strongly against Rassemblement National from a uh, a black uh, uh, Frenchman of, of immigrant um, uh, origins that t to... Uh, really speak very strongly from a sports person's point of view, which sometimes is is controversial because you know sportsmen can't and women can't have political opinions. You know, it's just not on. Just you know, score points don't don't get involved in politics. Yeah, really. But any other human being, like, is that so derogatory? It's like Laura Ingram, it's so derogatory about like sports people as if they only up there are so one dimensional. Anyway. The, you know, this goes back to France 1998, the World Cup then when you had the, the rainbow team that, that sort of put pay to rising notions of, um, you know, ethnic racial discontent within within uh, France. And then they won, won the World Cup, in fact, their own World Cup in France, and it all became very positive and it kind of put pay to that at least for some time. And now it's boiling over again. Uh, because you in France, you have not only the kind of EU free movement of people. Um, it's not an EU thing. The thing about immigration, like immigration is, it's not an EU thing per se. But it's, if you're in a Schengen area, once immigrants, illegal immigrants can get, do get into a European country, then they can kind of freely move around much more easily because the internal borders are more porous. Uh, but the whole issue of immigration is 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 an international thing, not an EU thing. It's like, you know, you've got climate migration, you've got war uh, zone migration, you've got economic migration, you've got all, all of these things that have existed forever. Um, and it, it's not, yeah, it's not because the EU is there that this is a problem, but it's a problem that the EU are dealing with like any country is more and more because the world has been destabilized by climate, by war, by economic uh, in inequality, and and this this is the you know you can try and put a sticking plaster on it by stopping people crossing the channel. It's the same in the UK's um, scenario by stopping boats, but it's like that's not stopping that's not curing the problem. How do we go about curing the problem? Is there going to have to be just insanely good environmental legislation and environmental work? Is there going to have to be really insane foreign diplomacy to stop wars? Well, yeah, if you have people like Russia doing this, then you're going to get, you know, if Russia prevail, you'll get millions of Ukrainians flooding into Europe. OK, uh, so do we do we do we not bomb Libya? Do we not go into Iraq? You know, all these kind of things are what trigger huge numbers of people moving. Um, what do we do about economic inequality? What do we do about you know areas of Africa becoming less and less tenable for uh, farming and for prosperity due to to climate issues and so on and war and so on and so forth? So these are massive issues that need to be solved that require much more thought than just stopping people on boats. I'm not saying that you shouldn't stop people on boats and uh, yeah, welcome in, welcome in. But I'm saying that you know, big problems require much bigger solutions. Those aren't solutions, those are plasters. Uh, anyway, I digress, as I often do. So you've got this issue with France. So what was I saying? Not only do you have the, the, the problems of uh, Ill illegal immigration, which, by the way, is much less of a problem than legal migration, if you're big on migration. So in the UK's position, people that have been getting really angry about migration uh, and voting X, Y, and Z because of that. You've got to remember that illegal migration is a very small proportion of, of net migration, which is 
basically getting people in to fulfill jobs that we don't want to do. So th again, how do you solve that problem? It's a much bigger problem than just getting angry about migration. Like solutions need to be much more strategically thought through. Um, but France has the added issue of being a you know near colonial country, whereby uh, large areas of North Africa were under their kind of empire or colonial influence. Uh, and other countries in Africa. And so there's been this long tradition of Le Magrida in the, like the North African, uh, um, North African settling into France and then ghettoizing in certain big cities like Marseille and, and Nice and whatever. And, and that then, you know, leading to a uh, generation on generation, um, tensions between um, between different communities in France. And so th th there's a big melting pot there. And out of that comes uh, Le Pen and Le Rassemblement National gaining more and more traction. Um, so Marine Le Pen says, if Macron wants to send troops to Ukraine and the Prime Minister is against it, then there will be no troops in Ukraine. End of. Uh, so that's how what she thinks. So Tim White says, uh, once financed by Russia, the far right party in France stop, pledges to stop Ukraine from using its weapons inside Russian territory. Marine Le Pen hopes her party prevails in a final round of parliamentary elections this weekend. And I like this. Just some some random person says, cool. Does Marine Le Pen, who supports uh, also support Russia not using its weaponry inside Ukrainian territory? So it's like. Yeah, you can have a you can be really strong on not not using not using French weaponry or Ukraine not using French wep weaponry to defend itself. But how freaking strong are you being on Russia stopping using their weaponry to bomb the crap out of Kharkiv and and cities around Ukraine? What are you saying about that, Marine Le Pen? Because at the moment it looks like the square root of Nafal, right? It looks at the moment like you would rather lick the boots of Putin than do anything strong and morally upstanding to defend those who have been um, overcome by aggression. Just, yeah, winds me up. And then we have Suggs from Madness here saying, sorry, Robert Fitzo saying, uh, that he's uh, yeah he's made his first public appearance since his assassination, but he's given a speech where he criticised obviously his liberal political opponents, uh, but he also praised Orban. Who knew uh, Orban next will be playing drums for madness uh, for his visits e to Kiev and Moscow, and then uh, look definitely sucks there goes on to uh, say. Um, well, this is Jürgen Naudit from Germany saying the countries of these two traitors, so Fitzo and Orban, that's uh, Slovakia and Hungary, are members of EU and NATO. When the, other when the other countries realise that this is a mistake, it will probably be too late. Germany has been has even delivered new Leopard 2 tanks to Orban. Uh, the Prime Minister of Slovakia praised the Prime Minister of Hungary for going to Moscow. Yesterday, Robert Fitzo appeared in public for the first time since he was shot. He said that if health allowed him, he to go to the Kremlin, he would gladly join Orban. Fitzo said, I don't want Slovakia to be among those countries that are a caricature of Western civilization. No, instead you can be a caricature of Russian dictatorship and a, and a caricature of someone uh, doing the bidding of a, of a dictator because you're, you're too weak to stand up for good moral um, pedigree. Just, ah, oh, whatever, mate. Meanwhile, Hungary cancelled a meeting between its foreign minister, Peter Schizatzo, and German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, after Schultz criticised Orban for his visit to Putin, according to Bloomberg. I've mentioned that. Viktor Orban came to the Russian Federation on July the 5th to discuss with Putin a peaceful settlement uh, of Russia's war against Ukraine. Um, absolute wingnuts, the, that pair of plonkers. Right, at, uh, that's an official, um, very diplomatic term I use that, that is academic as well. You find it in all the journal, journals, pair of plonkers. Uh, at NATO, at the NATO summit in Washington, that is very uh, imminent. Uh, acting Prime Minister of Bulgaria, Dimitar Glavchev, announced that Bulgaria will propose initiating peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. Bulgaria is a funny place that is... Very important. It's very important for Ukraine in terms of the massive amount of uh, weaponry and ordnance it manufactures on for Ukraine. At one stage at the beginning of the war, apparently it was it was providing one third of Ukraine's entire ordnance. Um, but 
Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you ammunition for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, there is still a lot of Russian influence inside Bulgaria, an awful lot. And I think there's a difference, is it, between the prime minister, president, or anyway, um, here we've got one of the acting prime minister here because the prime minister, I think, refused to go. Uh, to the NATO summit said, I genuinely believe we should advocate for peace negotiations with Bulgaria acting as the mediator. So they're offering to uh, be the mediators there. Uh, NATO, though, uh, speaking of which, and it's going to be very interesting to see the new NATO uh, new NATO meeting or the, the, the summit that's going to take place and be the first public outing really for uh, UK's new Prime Minister Keir Starmer. Hopefully we're going to be really strong on defence there and uh, yeah and helping Ukraine and we will return to him in a little while. South Korea though will discuss new mechanisms to aid Ukraine said the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. This is really good news. He mentioned flagship projects for Ukraine on medical training of Ukrainian soldiers to be considered at the summit in at Washington. I mean that's great but medical training versus an absolute bucket load of artillery ammunition i know which i'd i'd take um right anton gerashenko here says russia imported about 73 percent of dual use goods and 90 percent of all semiconductors and other microelectronics from who knew it's china this was stated by the u.s charge d'affaires at the osce so that's a security grouping Catherine Brooker, uh, during a meeting of the OSCE Permanent Council in Vienna, the People's Republic of China, or PLC, has provided Russia with a large number of dual-use technologies and weapons precursors that have been used to build weapons systems, including nitrocellulose, which is used to produce gunpowder ma machines and optics needed to produce drones, missiles and shells, she said. According to her, uh, as of February 2023, China has increased monthly supplies of dual use goods of Western origin to Russia by more than 500%. Beijing support peaked in June 2023 when Russia imported $162 million worth of goods from China that originated in countries that imposed sanctions on Russia. China is funding the greatest, quote, China, China is funding the greatest threat to European security since World War II, the US diplomat emphasized. China are a massive problem and a backdoor supporter of you of russia and the russian military project now in the same way kazakhstan has been involved in being the conduit one of the major con conduits kazakhstan kyrgyzstan of goods through to russia now the russian ministry of transport has complained that kazakhstan has started to detain trucks of russian trucking companies carrying european goods in foreign semi-trailers to the neighboring country after rehitching them at the border with the european union uh, kazakhstan simply does not want sanctions so it could be that kazakhstan are actually starting to um, respond to a bit of pressure from the EU there, so it's good news. Now, the EU has imposed san new sanctions on Belarus, targeting sanctions circumvention. Ukraine returns five of its citizens. Oh, no, that's something else. Um, but, interesting, we'll just throw this in anyway. Ukraine's returned uh, five of its citizens held in Belarusian prisons and the latest prisoner swap with Russia. So there's been another prisoner swap with Russia. Uh, but, yeah, so Belarus is being targeted with sanctions. And then just to go on with Belarus, as if, you know, you weren't worried enough about China helping out Russia and the possible um, incoming US isolationism in November if the elections go one particular way. The Chinese military personnel have arrived in Belarus for joint exercises. So Belarus has just joined the CSO, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, and Lo and behold, the Chinese army starts arriving in Belarus. A group of Chinese army personnel arrived uh, today to participate in a joint anti-terrorist training, the Belarusian Defense Ministry reported. So as these relationships get closer and closer, some people dismiss and say, oh, there'll be nothing, bricks will be nothing, so on and so forth. But if you dismiss these things, then you allow them to grow. It's, it's like if you dismiss some kind of, I don't know, fungal infection you might have or some kind of, uh mold that that's that's getting uh darker and crispier you're like oh it's okay it's only a little mold it's not gonna oh it's only a oh i've got cancer oh i've been taken over by some fungal infection and i'm now um um on that on that show what's that show 
not the show, the computer game and the show, Last of Us, Last of Us, with those people with the big, bah. anyway, I digress, obviously, but the point is that we should not dismiss, like, bricks just because they aren't going to challenge the dollar right now, like tomorrow, no, of course they're not, but if they're taking on Saudi Arabia, and if they're taking on this country, and they're taking on that country, and they, they grow and grow and grow, then I'm talking like 50 years time, they're a worry. And when you've got the SEO, and when you've got CTSO, and when you've got all these other organizations that are pitting nations against the West, then this is a challenge that needs to be considered very strongly. And Moldova will generate electricity for Ukraine in exchange for gas, according to the Minister of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Generation plants will be installed in the territory of Moldova, which will use natural gas supplied by Ukraine. So uh, Ukraine get electricity and, uh, and I do believe Ukraine are producing quite a lot of gas at the moment. So Moldova will get gas in, in return. That seems like a pretty good, pretty good deal there. Now, uh, just another thing on old school rockers here. So Judas Priest. Uh, Ilya Pon Ponomarenko says, metal gods know what is right. You got, I think it's Judas Priest, is it? Um, oh yeah, hashtag, G <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've got good old Midlanders, uh, Judas Priest here. Is it Rob, Rob, Rob Halsey? What's his name, Rob Halsey? Something like that. Anyway, a uh, rocking out. Now I find it weird that so many old school rockers, like who have we seen? We've seen Judas Priest. We've seen uh, Scorpions recently. We saw... Um, Rod Stewart, wasn't it? And all all these people of, of that kind of era being really strong behind Ukraine. Actually, we've seen Imagine Dragons and, and a number of others, but but I always like it when these kind of popular culture icons also uh, show support for what is good and right in this sense and, and speak to their audiences. And hopefully that gets you know, it spreads in, in, in a really positive way there. Now we're going to move on to US politics as it pertains kind of to Ukraine, because actually the outcome of the election in November is hugely important. Now there's an awful lot of stuff going on with the whole Biden Trump thing. Uh, Biden has just done a big interview with ABC through Stepanopoulos. Uh, and I don't think it did much to assuage worries, really. Uh, and you are starting to see more and more people come out of the Democratic woodwork to suggest that actually there needs to be a changeover. I mean, there's too much news to go through, but Biden defends his campaign as swing state. Democrats call for him to exit the race. Top Democrats plan crisis meeting despite Biden's vow to fight on. So he's vowed to fight on. His family's behind him. Uh, but my goodness. So uh, what's happened? Today's recap. So uh, congressional Democrats are to hold an emergency Sunday meeting to discuss Joe Biden's tottering presidential candidacy after a primetime television interview. One I just mentioned failed to dispel doubts triggered by last week's debate. Hakeem Jeffries, so he's the speaker, uh, the minority speaker for for the House Democrats. Uh, oh, yeah, as it says, they scheduled the meeting for Sunday, even as Biden struck a defiant posture in Friday's interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Uh, Gavin Newsom, though, who is potentially one of his re replacements, is really strongly uh, behind Biden, campaigning on his behalf. But yeah, you've had people come out, um, a load of different sort of governors and... Um, uh, other, other, so a couple of senators, I think, and a number of um, representative, House of Representative representatives, lawmakers, have come out and said Biden needs to go. Right. So, what one of the big key things will be for Biden going will be the polls. And what happened with the polls is that when he got, when he had a bad debate, and everyone like ignored the absolute nonsense that Trump spouted. His his. Polls initially seemed to be quite stable and people were like, oh, actually, it wasn't that bad. And then they dipped, particularly in the um, swing states. But then these polls have come out today, which has shown actually they've gone back up to being not too bad in the swing states. So Bloomberg, Biden closes the gap with Trump in key states after failed debate. U.S. President Joe Biden is closing the gap, trailing Republican Donald Trump by just 2% in the swing states. And in fact, some of them he's ahead, I think. Biden leads Trump in Michigan and Wisconsin. Yeah, he is within the polls' statistical tolerance in Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and North Carolina, and trails most in the key state of Pennsylvania. And so this then might give Biden a bit of wind behind his sails to keep going. As some people say, like the safest thing to happen is Biden to just stay in a race. Like, everything else is too much of a risk. There are arguments going either way but anyway there you go it's it's all happening um and uh i guess we'll we'll have to see uh so we're, we're now going to move on to 
uh, yes, so this, we're, no, before we move on, actually, we'll, we'll stay with Phillips O'Brien here saying, OK, this is what I'm hearing from Washington from someone with far better connect connections to the top of the US politics than me. Overall, quote, overall, Friday was a pretty good day, though it will take a few more days to see what happens with the polls. The family and the president are committed. If pressed, I would say it's a toss up 50-50 at present. Uh, there are lots of people talking but in the end this will be decided by the family they are committed as i said the internal polls that they have are not as bad as the public ones uh, do with it what you may uh yeah it's going to be interesting uh, lots of people disagree on on the best way forward here now on the other hand oh and um, by the way like i think this is really really worth remembering this this is a, such a good point from Adam Kinzinger. So a Republican who is voting Biden or voting Democrat against Trump. So he's, he's not a fan of Trump, but he's a former Republican congressman. So he said, just to level set, the fact that the Democrats are having discussions about their party doesn't show weakness. It shows strength. They aren't a cult. They have people who feel free to have opinions. Take pride in that. The GOP is a cult where an idea gets you kicked out. He was kicked out, right? You cannot question Trump or you get kicked out of the party, which is why people don't stand up and say things against Trump, which is why the aid was screwed for seven months because no one was prepared to come out and say, we need to get this aid to Ukraine right now. Stop piddling about Trump. And we need to not listen to this one person who's not even leader of the party. You know, we are in Congress. Why are we beholden to this person? But everyone was quiet because they knew if they spoke out, they would be kicked out of the party. And Adam Kinzinger, who's been kicked out of the party and being kicked out uh, of, of uh, his position, is, is saying such a strong point, which is like, these are healthy discussions for democracy. Don't say the Democrats are in chaos. Actually, well, they might be. It might be chaos, but it's a reflection of a healthy democracy. If that is the case, that you aren't completely scared to say anything for uh, for threat of being ostracised and losing your position. That's such a, such an important thing to remember. Uh, now we've got uh, this is Eldridge Colby, who is a real problem. He's going to be one of uh, Trump's. Um, people. C Colby constantly regurgitates Russian propaganda, so it's unsurprising that Russia is pleased by his policy agenda. In normal times, Russia co-opting members of their party would have been a fire alarm, uh, five alarm fire for the GOP, but now it's uh, the, at least tacitly encouraged. This is a really interesting point. So what's happened here? Well, a former KGB agent has praised an ex-Trump admin staffer, uh, Elbridge, Elbridge Colby, someone that I've referred to a couple of times, someone I've, I've, I've said a few things against on Twitter, actually, because he says egregious things that are supportive of Russia, effectively. On state TV, uh, this had been said by a former KGB agent, suggesting that his foreign policy would implement the position that the US, quote, doesn't need Ukraine at all. Colby is a contributor to the 900-page Project 2025 document. So you've got this document, which is a blueprint for Trump presidency from day one of him taking power in November or January if he does indeed win the election in November. Russian TV has celebrated Trump's Project 2025 ally uh, in, in his support but and by extension kind of celebrated Project 2025 I guess. So Project 2025 is gathering more and more I guess negative traction as people are hearing about it. So people uh, like you and I were talking about this months ago but in the American consciousness it's only just kind of starting to really bite through right break through into into public consciousness and it is really really worrying oh sorry this is out of uh, position so also uh, party sponsors are also starting to pull out for biden and that's going to kick biden into possibly doing something if, if the money isn't going to come in activists sending letters and party sponsors and uh, whatnot so anyway back to project 2025 it's a real worry it's like christian nationalism it outlaws all sorts of things interestingly things like pornography would be outlawed um by by uh, project 2025 but loads of things like you know reproductive rights and etc 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 and indeed chris o'wiki saying u.s veterans should be aware of what the pro-trump project 2025 has in mind for them so max burns here saying limiting combat veterans to 10 years of disability claims ending enrollment in va medical care for class 7 and 8 veterans and cutting disability pay for veterans to by 160 billion dollars which in case you were wondering is the entire budgeted amount for disability pay 
uh, authorizing the president to refuse funding for congressionally budgeted items if he deems those projects unnecessary or ideologically wrong, authorizing the president to redirect budgeted money from other areas of the federal government to build a wall in the US-Mexico border, eliminating the term sexual orientation, diversity, equity and inclusion, gender equality, abortion and reproductive rights from all federal laws and regulations. Just insane that. Um, uh, uh, ending overtime protections for 4.3 million federal workers and reducing retirement benefits for the entire federal workforce. Removing 33 million Americans from Medicare and pushing them into Medicare Advantage or, or, or private options with less coverage. Deny federal student loan access to students in 25 states that currently provide in-state tuition to undocumented immigrants. Estimating the federal Head Start pro eliminating the federal Head Start program, essentially kicking 1 million children out of education programming nationwide. Rename the Department of Health and Human Safety as the Department of Life and turn the department into an advocate for extensive restrictions on contraception and abortion na nationwide, dismantling the Department of Homeland Security and replacing it with a new intelligence agency directed at American citizens accountable only to the president, immediately begin the detention and deportation of 10 million uh, undocumented immigrants, bypassing the judicial deportation legal process in favour of executive orders from the White House, drastically reducing the availability of H2A and H2B work visas for skilled migrant workers, ending all protections from the Dream Act for the children of undocumented migrants who came to this country as babies, implementing a 10% across the board tariff uh, on all imported goods, which economists estimate would cost American families over $1,500 per year at higher in higher prices, ending or sharply reducing federal food assistance programs for 21.6 million American households, including programs aimed at addressing child hunger. He said, I could keep going on and on and on, right? So, but also the loads of nefarious stuff to do with, um, uh, uh, oh my goodness! Yeah, We're, look, all, all this other other stuff here. Let's just go into this because I've you're here now. Um, here are a few more nightmares. Kevin Roberts forward to Project Twenty Twenty Five. So Kevin Roberts is a guy that said this is going to be a new American revolution. He's just been uh, in interviews saying that. Uh, it calls for president to use undefined emergency powers to prosecute companies involved in the production or, or sale of pornography using the eighteen seventy three Cornstock anti. Act anti-vice law to criminalize the sending of abortion pills, contraception, and literature advocating for abortion through the U.S. Postal Service, reversing the FDA's approval on abortion pills and implement a ban on both pill and surgical abortion nationwide, eliminating the entire federal ser civil service and replacing it with appointees solely loyal to Donald Trump, installing all senior state and defense department officials in acting roles that don't require Senate confirmation, invoking the Insurrection Act on day one, whether there are protests or not, and empowering the military to serve as domestic law enforcement to crack down on peaceful protests, restructuring the NSA the FBI and the Department of Justice and our intelligence agency so they report solely to the president with no cabinet level oversight, requiring schools to promote a biblically based education program that teaches the moral correctness of heterosexual two-parent family, eliminating the Environment Protection Agency, the Department of Education and all federal agencies. What? Suspending all Im immigration into the United States, repeal the Bipartisan Refugee Act of 1980 and US participation in international treaties governing the uh, treatment of asylum seekers. So basically, that's what Project 2025, among many, many other things would do. Uh, as I say, look into it in, in terms of separation of church and state. Uh, uh, in insane. Now. Trump, I think, is starting to realise that not everyone is up for this. And in fact, most people are not up for this. And in fact, there are elements all over Project 2025 that are absolutely heinous, right? Uh, and he's come out and said, and, and by the way, CJ Engel, who is part of Heritage. So Project 2025 is a Heritage uh, Foundation think tank a production, right? They produce this 900 page document. This is what Trump's going to do when he gets in, in, into power. Everyone's been talking about this for ages, right? Everyone knows about this. And CJ Engels just said, we're coming for your civil rights ne act next and then the New Deal. We're going to repeal the 20th century. This is the idea. They're going to repeal the 20th. You want to get back to the 1900s, right? That's Project 2025. You think you've got it bad now? Well, you know, you want slavery back? No, I expect most of these people probably do. So anyway, uh, Donald Trump then came out and said this on Truth Social. I know nothing about Project 2025. I have no idea who's behind it. I disagree with some of the things they're saying and some of the things they're saying are absolutely ridiculous and abysmal, which is probably quite correct. But the fact that he says he didn't know anything about it is absolute nonsense. He says, anything they do, I wish them luck, but I have nothing to do with them. I have nothing to do with them. Right. And of course, he's denying this, says Josh Marshall, even though all of his key people are involved in it. 
This is a dense hope and it's a real and powerful one, which is why Trump is reacting like this. So I'm trying to give you a sense of where this election is going. So the Democrats have got this real issue with are they going to have Biden or someone else? And is that going to absolutely throw their chances of, of winning the election? The Republicans have suddenly got this thing that they weren't expecting to have to deal with as a problem now, which is Project 2025, because the more people find out about it, the more they read this 900 page document, the more they think, gee whiz, this ain't cool. So Trump's now come out and said, I know nothing about it, except it's been written by all of his mates, right? And he clearly knows a lot about it. And as Marshall says here, the, you know, Dems, this is the a real hope for the Dems and it's a powerful one. Trump's actual agenda is toxic. It's li he's literally running away from it. And that's a lot of work. Uh, that's a lot to work with for any nominee. So Trump distances himself from Project 2025, which is run by the Heritage Foundation, which lays out the extremely conservative roadmap they want Trump to adopt should he win the election. Now, He's claim, he claims he knows nothing about it and he doesn't know, you know, he, he basically, what, what was the claim? I, um, uh, I, so I have no idea who is behind it. That was it. I have no idea who's behind it. So Brian Taylor, Car Brian no, Taylor, Trump's says original this. claim in his post on True Social that he has no idea who's behind it. This is yet another example of the guy treating his supporters like they are absolute fools because Trump may claim that he doesn't know who's behind it, but I'm pretty sure he knows John McEntee, Trump's former director of the White House Presidential Personnel Office and one of his closest aides while in office. Pretty sure he knows Russ Vogt, who ran the Office of Management and Budget in the Trump White House. Pretty sure he knows Paul Dans, the head of Project 2025, who was the chief of staff at the Office of Personnel Management. Pretty sure he knows his former deputy chief of staff, Rick Dearborn. Pretty sure he knows his former housing and urban development secretary, Ben Carson. Pretty sure he knows his acting deputy homeland security secretary, Ken Cuccinelli. Pretty sure he knows Peter Navarro, who served in Trump's National Trade Council. Pretty sure he knows the Heritage Foundation, the largest conservative think tank in the United States. Pretty sure he knows his own campaign press secretary, Carolyn Levitt, who literally starred in recruitment ads for Project 2025. So let's be clear, Trump knows these people, but he also knows that the people who support him will swallow his lies without an ounce of pushback. And so he lies to them without hesitation. Republicans hate Democrats, but not nearly as much as they hate their own supporters. In fact, here's Heritage President Kevin Roberts again broadcasting that it will be the Trump administration that will actually enact Project 2025. We've been working with all of them on one project since soon after Joe Biden took the oath of office before any conservative presidential candidates had even entered the race. As my friend and colleague Paul Dans before talked about briefly, our Project 2025 has developed a comprehensive policy agenda, but even more importantly, recruiting people, 20,000 people to go into the next administration, hopefully to help take back this country for you and for your so he goes on to talk about that and the idea that you would recruit 20,000 people to take over the uh, administration and Trump would know nothing about this is just, and all those people anyway so there you go uh, that that's what's going on and and you're going to hear more and more about this so this is why I want to talk about it um you know coordination doesn't get clearer than this says uh, Brian Tyler Cohen but uh, Trump is denying there is any knowledge of this uh, even though his own national press secretary, Caroline Levitt, has been working on the project and advertising it, so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, and then at the same time, you get this kind of rhetoric, and this is like pretty dangerous. Uh, let's just listen to him. Used to meet evil on the battlefield, and guess what? We, you know, it was a time when we used to meet evil on the battlefield, and guess what we did to it? We killed it. We didn't quibble about it. We didn't argue about it. We didn't fight about it. We killed it. So you're getting like, here's a, a GOP governor nominee, Mark Robinson, talking about, uh, he then goes on to say, you know, liberals are like this. and But, you know, we used to kill Japanese in the Pacific and we killed Nazis in Germany. We should just, uh, the implication is we should go and kill the liberals because, yeah, uh, just the, the really uh, problematic, divisive rhetoric that, that's not helping at all. Um, uh, talk about some interesting rhetoric. This has come from a British uh the new foreign minister who has previously said uk's new foreign secretary sorry not minister foreign secretary once called trump quote a neo-nazi sympathizing sociopath so david lammy and the new uk labor government might have a little bit of work to do if trump does get in in, in november because 
share some uh, previous that's happened there. Now, some of you have, have, I've done a couple of videos on the UK elections and I did one with Professor Gerdes, which has been quite well received. So explaining the elections with Prof Gerdes Explains, you can go and check that out uh, on his channel. Um, and was some some one thing that was repeated a number of times in the threads was that uh, the way that UK politicians, MPs, kind of uh, accept defeat. They give a speech at the count and they they hand over to the person that takes over. And Rishi Sunak did this as Prime Minister a couple of times. And actually the speeches have been really, really magnanimous. And they, they are every year, every election, when, when, it, when it happens. We, we're just quite good at saying, do you know what? You guys won. There's no January the 6th. There's no riots. There's there, there's no anger and there's no even accusing the other guy when you're when you're doing this. There's you th there's a ritual. You thank the the counters, the, the council members that have been spending their free time counting and securing the building. You thank the police. You do all these things that are good and nice and proper. And then you say thank to you to all my uh, my the people running against me and. Uh, and I'm I'm taking I, I'm now no longer going to be UMP, but this person's going to be UMP, and I wish him all the very best because, uh, you know, you are so important to me as the people of this constituency, and so on and so forth. And Phillips O'Brien said, I wish if I could ask my fellow Americans to do one thing with the UK election, it's to watch the concession speeches. They are almost all gracious and in good humour, providing legitimacy to the new government and reaffirming a commitment to democracy. And it's absolutely right there. Like I hadn't realised how special that is. In the UK, and I'm sure in many other countries as well, but in the UK, we are, there's an, a lovely transference of power that takes place seamlessly and it happens like that it's not november to january it's literally like number 10 down the street gets cleared out that night and starmer moves in the next day right soon acts out starmer's in and it's mental but it happens quickly uh, and it's and it's seamless and it's what we're used to and when the um, mp loses their seat that night they are no longer mp that's it this person's mp and we're just very good at accepting that and giving speeches that support that, which kind of communicates an essence of peaceful transference of power that I've taken for granted in the UK system. And it is, it is really lovely to see. I mean, here, here's an example of an SNP up in Scotland, uh, set, you know, not only giving a speech on a night, but saying, you know, Stuart McDonald from the SNP who lost to Gordon McKee. Uh, this guy's actually quite involved with defence uh, and, and I think Ukraine as well. Uh, there will be more to say in the coming days about the results we have faced, but for now I want to thank my phenomenal campaign team and all those who voted for me. Being the MP for Glasgow South is the single best job in the world and I warmly congratulate Gordon McKee on his election. I wish him well as he gets stuck in and don't doubt he will make a thoroughly decent constituency MP. Just as my predecessor was always on hand to offer me support and advice, I extend the very same hand to Gordon. How lovely is that? Just like, I wish you the best. And look, mate, if you if you want some advice or if you want some help with anything, I'm here for you. And that's just brilliant. My party must take the time to listen, so that's the SP, and learn from what the public have told us. We have been defeated well beyond what any of us expected. It won't be easy to learn and change, but learn and change we must. For now, I plan to get some sleep and enjoy the step back from public life that I've been granted. Democracy is a precious thing, and we should never take it for granted. And that's absolutely brilliant. And I can't emphasize how lucky we are that that happens almost every time there is a changing of the guard. And going on to, to not soon act, to Keir Starmer, the new prime minister, he has a very busy week ahead of him, of course. Um, but I thought I'd play you part of one of his first speeches here because it pertains to Ukraine. We'll work with them. Later on Tuesday, I shall set off to Washington for the NATO summit. I've already had a number of international calls, as you will know and as you would have expected, uh, to establish the relations across with other countries, to have really important discussions about Ukraine and other pressing issues, and Washington will be an opportunity for me to have further discussions with some of the leaders I've already spoken to and some that I'm due to speak to. It is, of course, an important summit on NATO. It is. Uh, for me to be absolutely clear that the first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO, 
Um, and, of course, uh, to reiterate, as I did to President Zelensky yesterday, um, the support that we will have in this country and with our allies towards Ukraine. The fact that he's already spoken to Zelensky is super important. The fact that in this is the end of his speech, this first like major speech, and he's saying the most important thing for the UK is defence and security, and I need to support NATO, and I need to support Ukraine, and we need to support NATO and Ukraine. So this will be a politics and a government that is about delivery, is about service. Self-interest is yesterday's politics. I want a politics and a country that works for you. We're a change. Brilliant. Happy days. I hope I hope that is what you hold yourself to as well, because we will hold you to it. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Speak soon. Toodle pips.